Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This is a multi-part series entitled C++ Models, conducted by CSIAC subject matter expert Dr. James Fawcett. This series will explore different conceptual models underlying the C++ programming language. This particular podcast will discuss compilation and execution. Hello. The second video uh, will begin with a model for uh, C++ compilation. So let's go to that uh, slide. Okay. So uh, <coughs> the C++ compilation process, the build process, uh, is um, interesting. Several things happen. So uh, when the build system um, uh, processes a CPP file, or processes source code, it does that one CPP file at a time. Uh, each of these translations of CPP files are independent of uh, all the other CPP files. So no information is carried over in that translation process. So uh, they're each done as individual entities. And um, that's actually for very large systems, that's an advantage because it means that um, the very large system is broken down into small pieces, each of which is translated. So we don't run into any issues with overflowing, uh, you know, compiler tables and so on. So um, we say that uh, CPP file and uh, all the files that it includes are a translation unit. What happens during this uh, translation is the first thing that runs is a preprocessor. Uh, so it picks up a CPP file and it um, includes for each of the pound include header files um, defined by that CPP file, it puts those header files in place uh, at the site of the pound include. And it does some other things to expand macros and uh, handle other uh, preprocessor definitions and so on, but the main function is to uh, build a large intermediate source code file that uh, has the uh, CPP, the package CPP, and every one of his headers in one single intermediate source, source code file. Normally we don't see that. We won't see it unless we ask the uh, compiler to generate it for us. And it's, uh, you know, it's typically very big because not only is it including other code that we may have written, but it's also including compiler library code, IO streams and F streams and stuff like that. Okay, so we build this intermediate uh, file and then the compiler digests that and creates an object file. And uh, if the um, options for the build process build a library, instead of building an object file, it builds a, you know, a static library, for example, or it might build a dynamic link library. For the moment, let's assume it builds an object file. And so now it keeps stepping through all the CPP files, building object files or libraries or DLLs or whatever. And when we've come to the last of the CPP files, we have a collection of object files and uh, those all get bound together by the linker. Uh, the reason that's necessary is that when we compile a CPP file, any calls within that same translation unit uh, get resolved immediately by the compiler. The compiler knows how all that code is laid out, and it just, uh, when you make a call to some function, it just sets the address to jump to the right, you know, site of that function code, uh, and away we go. But if you make a call outside of that translation unit, which we do all the time, one package makes a call into another package, uh, the compiler can't resolve that. So it builds a table of uh, unresolved references, and it's the linker that resolves all those references. Now, when the linker has all the OBJ files, 
um, and or libraries. Uh, it's got all the uh, things it needs uh, to resolve those references. Basically what happens is as it's compiling, it's building a link map and all those references can be resolved within that link map. And so uh, that results in an execution image. So all of the object files and any static library files that were built get resolved by the linker and it builds an execution image. And that execution image can be loaded as soon as we uh, ask it to run, it loads. Now, if it depends on any dynamic link libraries, uh, those can't get resolved until load time. Uh, and uh, so, because we don't want them, we don't want the linker to uh, make them part of this execution image. Part of the idea of these dynamic link libraries is that we may never use them, so why put them, why put their source code into the execution image? Uh, and also that source code is shared, maybe shared by many different execution images. So for lots of reasons, we don't want those uh, dynamic link libraries bound into the execution image. So uh, when we load, then the loader has to do that final uh, a resolution of unresolved references, just like the linker, it's often called a linking loader. And its job is just to bind any dynamic link libraries into the execution image, and then we get a running process running our program. So that's the, that's the um, build model for uh, C++. Uh, and it works really well, has for years, it's you know, a lot of history behind the system. Um, and the preprocessor has some quirks and people complain about that a lot, but uh, basically it, it works fine. Uh, you might want to know that uh, as of C++ 20, a new module-based system is coming uh, that will downplay the use of header files, and that'll be interesting. Um, there's only experimental uh, uh, libraries, module libraries uh, in place now. Uh, I typically don't uh, start working with a facility until it becomes an official part of the language just because there's, you know, there's lots of stuff to look at and deal with and you might as well wait until it's stable enough um, to invest some significant amount of time in. So anyway, um, this is the process we have as of C++ 17 uh, and it's been the same process we've used for years since uh, almost the very beginning. It actually started with the C language and uh, has continued through all the versions of C++ up through C++ up through and including C++ 17. Okay, so uh, one of the consequences of this build process is the uh, definition first rule. The C++ compiler, the language was designed to support one pass compilation. Uh, so what that means is that before we can create an instance of something, uh, we need to know its size. So the compiler can't lay out code for it until it knows how big it is. And the only way it knows how big it is is to see the declaration for the class uh, that we're creating an instance of or whatever. So, uh, so we have to see the definition first. Uh, we have to see the declaration first of a class before we can create an instance of uh, that class. So, um, you can create a pointer to an incomplete type. So maybe we've declared, a, made a forward de declaration like class A semicolon. So this just tells the compiler A is a name of a class, um, but it's not defined yet. So we can make a pointer to that um, incomplete type, but we can't, we can't use it to, ins to uh, uh, select or find the, uh, find the contents of, <laughs> Okay, that pointer, because the contents don't exist yet. So, uh, but sometimes that's useful when we have dependencies. For example, when we build a graph class, a, a directed graph class, we might find that the vertices and edges are mutually dependent. A um, vertex is gonna hold a bunch of edges and each edge has to point to a specific vertex. And so they have to know about each other. That's a, that's a mutually dependent relationship. And so what that means is the only way this is gonna work is that uh, we create a, a forward um, declaration for one of those types 
and then um, define the other type, and then below it, uh, now we can define the um, the type that was. We can complete the incomplete type. So that's that's the way that works. So the definition first rule says instances of classes, structs, and enums can be created only after those uh, entities are declared. Uh, and so, you know, one mental model is if you think, the CP, uh, think of the CPP file as a big collection, an ocean of syntax, and the include files are like tributaries, rivers coming down, filling that ocean, the rivers of syntax, then uh, the entity declarations have to be upstream from the point of an entity creation. We have to have seen that declaration before we can create uh, the instance. So here, upstream simply means a compiler scan order. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, uh, C++ build process in a nutshell. Um, not too hard to understand, but you know, you really need to know what those pieces are so you understand you know, when things don't go well with it, with the, uh, you get link errors or something like that, you really have to have a model of that build process to, to make sense out of the link errors. Okay, now for the second part of this um, video, I want to talk a little bit about program execution. So uh, program model, uh, every program um, uh, has a main, which is the entry point for the program. That's where computation starts. Actually, there's some initial, initialization code that runs when you load the process, but, but the real computation, the computation that you put in place starts when you enter main. And in main, main may call a function, and that function may call another function, and that function may call another function. Each time a function is called, we create a, uh, an allocation of stack memory, which is scratch pad memory. It's just temporary memory that we store the arguments of the function, any local data that's defined in the uh, function, and so on. And we use them while the thread of execution is in that function. When the thread of execution leaves that function, that memory becomes invalid. The next time we enter another function or open another scope, we'll probably overwrite that memory. So it it's, becomes invalid as soon as we leave it. Um, so uh, uh, when we're uh, implementing a function, uh, let's say we're um, declaring some types, we have a lot of freedom about where we put those types. Unlike the um, managed languages, uh, uh, we can store an instance in static memory up in the same region where code is, and that memory has static memory has a lifetime of the program. Uh, we can store an instance in stack memory. So if we're in a function and we just define a local variable in there, we're defining it in the stack allocation for that function. So we're allocating the stack memory. Uh, if we call new on uh, an uh, instance, then we're allocating it in the native heap, and the lifetime of that um, uh, lives from the time we call new until we discard it with a call to delete. So these three memories have different lifetimes. Static memory has a lifetime of the program. Stack memory has the lifetime of a uh, the thread um, uh, entering a scope until it leaves the scope. Uh, scope may be a function, but it might be a lower level scope, like an if block, for example. Same thing happens there. Uh, uh, and the lifetime in, of objects in heap memory uh, start with a call to new and end with a call to delete. Uh, and we have some ways of interacting with the environment, um, uh, CN, IF stream, C out, O if stream, C air, C log. These are all C++ streams, and there uh, we can use, uh, probably don't, um, but we could use the uh, C level libraries, standard in, standard out, standard error, and standard log, but usually we use streams. And by the way, C in and C out and C error and C log, you don't have to create those objects. They're global objects that are created when the library is loaded uh, and initialized, so um, we just use them. Any place in, in the program, we can use C out, for example. You, you, we don't have to create them. OK. So, uh, so here's uh, program memory. So uh, 
when the thread of execution enters a function, we allocate stack memory. Same thing happens for every scope. Program may place any of its entities and instance of user defined class into static memory, stack memory, or heap memory. We've already described how that happens. And in the next uh, model, we'll describe the consequences uh, of uh, that placement. Uh, this, uh, so this streams interface is one way to interact with the environment. Another is that we accept arguments from the, uh, if it's a console application, we'll accept arguments from the command line. And even if it's a, um, um, a graphical user interface, uh, they have command lines and all of the frameworks provide a way of getting access to that command line. So that's another way of interacting at least getting acquiring inputs uh, uh, from the environment. And finally, uh, our program can interact directly with a platform. This is native code, so we can, we can make calls directly into the platform APIs. Um, uh, and how, exactly how we do that depends on the, uh, the platform we're on. For Windows, you know, we uh, pound include Windows.h, and that's a big, that includes lots of different header files, uh, and most of the things we need, we get uh, that way. Uh, if we're uh, programming for Linux platforms, typically uh, we're loading um, each of the platform API libraries as we need them, and there's usually a cluster of them that get loaded, you know, for the directory system and, and so on. Okay, so uh, that ends the um, second video. Uh, so we've talked about the compilation model and we've talked about an execution model. And in the next video, we'll continue that with a memory, um, begin that with the discussion of a memory model and uh, continue on from there. Uh, with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention and um, uh, we may see you in a subsequent video, and if so, great. Um, so uh, with that, goodbye. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content informative and useful. If you would like to provide feedback or comments, please visit our website at www.csiac.com iac.org, where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you. Did you know that CSIAC offers free monthly webinars featuring experts in the areas of cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management? Come see leading industry professionals talk about industry practices and leading research. Make sure to visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars in order to subscribe to our mailing list and see when the next webinar series is available. There you can also watch previous webinar series to catch up. Visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars.